I'm here and I have a fantastic green screen. Awesome. That sounds like what I would expect. how to full screen. I thought that it was... It is F11, but if I if I don't use the correct uh, button, it, it actually doesn't input F11, and that's a problem. All right, so yeah, uh, let's let's do a let's do let's do an emulator. Let's do a CPU. Um, I think ultimately I'll probably end up like building a couple of like really elementary level emulators on stream. Uh, but let's start with just something super didactic. Omnipotent Entity, thank you so much for 24 months. That's just wild. So yeah, um, all of the times that I have programming on my YouTube, I get like, there's just a, a, a family of comments that I seem to get. People want me to use Haskell. People wish that I would use um, C. People wish that I would use um, Python. Uh, so I'm going to be using Ruby. So I feel like that'll make everybody mad. There we go. should use Pascal. I actually don't know any Pascal, which would make it very, very difficult to uh, to use. Which, although that would be a really funny, that would be a good goof. Use Pascal instead of Haskell and, and say, oh, but I, I thought you, you wanted, oh, I misheard. But yeah, uh, so I'm going to do it in Ruby um, because Ruby is easy. That's true, you did suggest Pascal to me a while back, and I continue to not know any at all. <laughs> Do the ultimate flex and write an emulator in BrainFuck? Uh, probably not. I think I'm, I am very likely not going to do that. Um, but this is going to be, I, I'm, so I'm recording uh, the output from, of course, uh, my virtual machine, and then I'm, I'm going to put this up, you know, just raw on YouTube, but I'm I'm gonna play around with editing down the stream today and uh, uploading it, aiming to be a little bit more didactic, uh, which doesn't mean don't ask questions. It definitely super duper, the, the purpose of these streams is to be able to be, you know, to, to help share information, to help share knowledge. Am I recording locally? Of course I'm recording locally. Not only am I recording locally, but I have two sessions of um, OBS, one of them recording the entire composited stream that you all see, and then another one recording well, here. I can I can switch to it real quick. Uh, this is this is what uh, the other thing that I'm recording looks like. So just real easy crop guide there, uh, you know, since it's not a 1080p uh, virtual machine that I'm capturing so that I can capture Full size. You have a video editor that I can hire on the cheap. I might hit you up for that. But yeah, so I think for this stream, I think the uh, the goal is going to be let's build out some scaffolding. Let's build out a framework that we can use in the future to build. You know, maybe it's a 6502 emulator, maybe it's a, a 5A22 emulator, whatever we want. Um, but we can we can design something that we can use and extend in the future to be able to uh, to to use as a domain specific language specifically for building out CPU emulators or system emulators. So to that end, like, it's not going to be super complex, the, the CPU that I'm going to design. In fact, it's only going to have a couple of opcodes because we only really need a couple of opcodes to make sure that our DSL works correctly. 
Um, but it'll it'll let us focus on making sure that the fundamentals work correctly. Do something different, make a 6800, the 8-bit predecessor to the 68K. The 68K is the first CPU that I learned how to write assembly for. But So just a little bit of background information, um, just in case folks don't know. So the way that uh, I am expecting that our CPU is going to work, it's pretty classical architecture. We're going to have like our CPU, which is going to connect to some manner of bus, which is then going to connect to, you know, various devices, RAM. Maybe we have uh, a cart with ROM on it. Maybe we're reading input, you know, from a controller, from a keyboard. It, it doesn't matter at that point. But at an MMU, well, the bus connecting to the RAM is going to act as our MMU for the super basic case. Um, and it's worth pointing out, like, what I build today is not expected to be accurate down to the silicon. Uh, we're going to... I mean, because we're just sort of building a, a CPU by the seat of our pants, it's not even going to be cycle accurate in that there's no reference specification. Uh, Twango, thank you so much for the uh, for the host. But in the future, the idea is that I would like it to be cycle accurate, um, even if it's not, you know, accurate down to the silicon. All right, uh, but that that should hopefully at least give us an idea of kind of what we're aiming for here. Yeah, you can do address extension. Like, there is a ton of stuff that you can do. But um, in general, what we want to start off with is, is something really basic, something that just proves that what we're building is going to work, and then after that we can iterate on it. And I, I want to take this pretty darn slow, um, just to, to make sure that everybody's on the same page, because the point of this is to be, like I said, pretty, pretty didactic, and... That's right, CPU connected to a bus via smiley face. Like all good CPUs are, really. I mean, it, it's more of a, a an equals greater than. It's it's a smiley face, but with a, a very pronounced pointed mouth. Let's let's call our, our CPU the, the TH8, Tina Hacks. We're gonna make it an 8-bit CPU. Why not? Anything else for right now? I think that'll do it for the moment. THX 1138, similar, slightly different. Can we run a BrainFuck interpreter on the emulated CPU? Well, given as how BrainFuck is just a Turing machine, uh, it stands to reason that yes, you would be able to, as long as the CPU is Turing complete. Catching up on chat. Otherwise, all right, I think we're good. All right, so to that end, we're gonna
I'm going to go ahead and build out uh, probably the CPU first because that actually should be fairly Yeah, we're, we're going to build this straight out, and then we can start abstracting it into a... Uh... into a DSL. Alright, so the CPU, of course, we need our, our bus connection, which we'll pass in. Look, I, I, I link to my Twitch in all of my YouTube videos, um, but there is no time when I will ever, ever, in any case, like, I, I will never say in anger, hey, make sure that you do all that engagement stuff. Because um, I, I don't care. Like, that's just really what it comes down to. I don't care. All right. So we're going to have... We're going to have a, a program counter. We need to know where we are pointing to in memory to be able to execute. Um, even though this is an 8-bit um, CPU, we're going to make this... The, the program counter specifically, we're going to make 16 bits. That way, we can have a, a decent amount of addressable range without having to worry about you know, shuffling pages and such. Stack pointer. We'll have an accumulator register. Pretty, pretty standard there. And then just have, I think, probably one general purpose register for this. There's no reason that we really need more than that. Yeah, no reason other than convenience, but for what we've got right now, we can always add more. Um, we're, we're not bound by having to actually figure out what things look like in the silicon, uh, which means that I can, I can do this if I want to, or I can do like this. I mean, I'd have to rename those all, but I don't, I don't have to care. Verilog stream, whew, that could be fun, but Maybe not today. Yep, we can absolutely add a, uh, we, we could, uh, now here I'd want to, uh, make the, we, we would want to make it so that, uh, accessing a accesses the least significant byte of EA. And then if we if we wanted to pull an Intel, we could do this. And then there we go. So now now we're pretending to be to be Intel with our CPU design. Oh, Nymphius, this is this is all in in Ruby. We are not doing um, actual CPU design. We're we're just uh, thinking through the way that we might design a CPU as a thought experiment to enable us to build an emulator, uh, which will in turn uh, we're going to take that, turn it into a domain specific language, which we can use to describe a sixty five hundred two. We can use it to describe. A, uh, you know, a 68K, whatever we want.
we were thinking the 65816's approach where it's 6502 compatible but still has the 16 bits addressable. Uh, yeah, my, hmm. I don't know, I don't know the CPU for the Super Nintendo well enough to, to say. Um, I know that the Game Boy does something really weird where like you have A and, and then like B is, um, another byte and those actually point to two bytes of a 16-bit register as well. And then A and B are just the upper and lower um, byte of a, a larger register. You've gotten a tad familiar since you've been working on uh, reverse engineering um, Mario's missing, yeah. Yeah, the Z80, A, F, B, C, D, E, and H, L, that, that's right. Okay. So what's the what's the cleanest way for us to, to think about the way that the bus is gonna work? I think. So first thing first, uh let's Let's assume that everything is RAM for now. We can just, like, have one chunk of addressable space, zero through FFFF, and... And then we can we can start drilling down from there. That's, that's probably going to be the easiest way to do this, so... Here, we're just going to go RAM. We're going to give it... give it that delicious 64k and then So there we go, that's that's easy for now. Later we're going to want to change this because we're going to be having more than one thing attached to the bus. But for right now, we're just CPU hooked up to a bus, hooked up to RAM. Am I going to hard code that RAM size? Yep, for right now. Sixteen bit address, eight bit registers, we're gonna do some kind of page system. Yeah, we're pretty much gonna to have to. So we can read at an address. So for that. Uh, we will just, we're going to return nothing. We'll return a zero if the bus is unable to, uh, to read from the address. Not going to be accurate, um, to just about any CPU, but for the purposes of getting us off the ground, that is perfectly fine. Lovely. And then... Oh, 
All right, there we go. Other than the fact that uh, I, I definitely should uh, make it so that we have slightly prettier stringification. Uh, hey, no, uh, no syntax problems so far. Perfect. Is this going to be treated as a CPU REPL, or am I going to treat opcodes in binary and execute? My plan is to, uh, since we get to define the opcodes, I'm just going to write, you know, like our first program can just be incrementing, you know, the A register and watching that happen in memory. Right now, that's perfectly fine. No, we don't need to do that. Just use the sigil. Sigil's fine. So that looks a little bit nicer to, uh, to look at. Later on, we'll, we'll make that a little bit better so that we can, I think one of the things that I'd like to do today is to build a like super simple um, visualization so that we can watch some regions of memory while we walk through it. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna make a decision Yo, Chaos, how's it going? I'm gonna make a decision. I'm gonna say program counter always starts at, at 8,000. Halfway through our, our available memory, that's where we expect the program to be loaded in for the sake of this CPU. That's gonna make a lot of stuff just easier. And now we need to start thinking about instructions. So I'm gonna have a stack. Uh, stack is a stack is just always gonna be part of a page uh, for the sake of this CPU. Um, Sinking through the way that that works because we're only going to be giving the stack pointer a single byte. Uh, it's always going to be limited to exactly uh, 256 bytes of memory, hex one, uh, 100 from 0 to FF, which means that the stack pointer is, for the sake of this, let's call it hex 100 to hex 1 FF. That's where our stack is allowed to live. It's never going to be able to go higher than that, which is fine. Not a big deal. That's true, I guess, uh, the the easiest, um, the easiest instruction to build is going to be a knock. So, knock, let's call that, will be FF. Um, and now, actually, we need to think about You need to think about one other thing that's not obvious until you start like trying to to think through how these instructions are going to look. We have two options essentially. Um, we can have opcodes be varying sizes. Uh, so, for example, a NOP would only ever need to be one byte. Eighty-eight. Hope that you're doing well. You'll be lurking and working out. Nice. 
So for example, NOP would only ever need to be one byte. Um, something like increment A, never gonna need to be more than one byte. However, that does actually mean that we end up having to think about how many bytes each opcode will be, because something like uh, jumping to an absolute address, uh, that would need to be, of course, the byte for the opcode, and then two more bytes for the address itself. Um, moving a, a specific value into a register, that would be a two-byte opcode. So we could make it so that every opcode is the same, the same length. But for something like this, uh, maybe maybe we start thinking about uh, about making it so that we do just have to know how many bytes uh, the program counter has to increment. So I did talk about wanting to make this cycle accurate. Um, obviously for this, this is a, a fake fictional CPU that doesn't exist. So this is kind of a, a practice in silliness, but in the future, so that we can you know, do something like a 6502, uh, different instructions do end up costing different numbers of cycles. Uh, the way that CPUs work, um, they're gonna have a bunch of inputs, tons of pins, uh, only a few pins for something like a 6502, uh, which don't all, like, that sets up what the CPU is going to do next. And it's easy to think about that as just like an instruction that gets executed, like one thing happens and then you get an output. But in practice, what happens is it sets off a cascade of different uh, different electrical signals, you know, firing throughout the CPU. Uh, you get this huge Rube Goldberg machine, very, very small Rube G Goldberg machine that ultimately ends up with you having an output. But almost every instruction takes more than one clock cycle so that it can work through everything. Profness, thank you so much for 21 months. undergrad all over again. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the goal of this stream is to be like as didactic and like slow moving as possible. Um, ultimately, I'll probably build a 6502 on stream. I'll probably build like a 68K maybe or a Rico 5A22, something like that. Um, because who doesn't, who doesn't love the Super Nintendo, right? Yeah, variable length instructions, very easy to encode, very easy to decode, very, very easy to make mistakes. Um, the last time that I was uh, building an emulator, it was uh, for a separate project. Um, and I needed to, uh, to have the ability to run arbitrary code on the MSP um, 430, which uses a... a a single size opcode for everything, which is very nice. Because um, it means at the moment that, you know, you, if, if you aren't aligned, uh, you know that something has gone terribly wrong. And that's great. Yeah, reverse engineering uh, variable length opcodes, way more of a pain in the ass. And you can see that when you look at uh, when you look at like assembly dumps of stuff that has data embedded into it, um, because data and and program code fundamentally are the same thing. So you can get some really wild output from you know something that has like an SSL key embedded into it or something like that. If you aren't being real careful to look for that. You've done ROM hacking for the N64 and the Super Nintendo. Having every instruction be 32 bits on the MIPS is real nice. Yeah. Yeah, I totally believe that. All right. 
So for, for now, we're just going to assume that all of the opcodes for our pretend CPU, they're, they're going to be exactly one cycle to execute, because why not? No reason not to. Oh yeah, technically you can absolutely write code that is an SSL key and then load your code as data. That is 100% true. One fun thing to do is to write your name out and then figure out how to turn your name not into efficient shell code, but into shell code. Make it so that your name could be executed directly by a CPU. And preferably at the end of it, you know, exec will bin bash or something like that. So we're going to want to be able to ink stuff, increment A, increment X. Let's just call this 80 for X, we'll call it 81. Maybe we'll call this 82. One of the things that you'll see, and we're not going to model this perfectly in this because this is a fake CPU. In fact, we've already not modeled it perfectly because NOP is going to be 255. Um, often, for example, uh, when you have something that's going to happen quite frequently. So uh, if we're, we're going to be working with a page system for our memory addressing, uh, maybe we want to be able to address the zero page a ton. It's quite often that you'll see that you might have a single pin that will always be brought high every single time that you're in that addressing mode. Um, likewise, you know, we're going to be working with the, a, the the accumulator register. We'll probably have 16 um, instructions, ultimately, you know, uh, way more than that, maybe, that um, can address the A register. And if we were to uh, account for that ahead of time, then maybe, maybe the pin that corresponds to the 2-bit, maybe that's just always high for the A register. Something to think about. That would mean that, for example, you know, something this 8.6 has the has the, the two pin brought high. So we would have to think about, you know, what does that mean? Or this would also have the two pin brought high. So suddenly we have to, you know, we would want to start thinking about, well, is the two pin always going to mean that we're doing something with A? That's right, the not totally touches the A register. That's what I've said. So like I said, we're not going to model that, but in a uh, real world scenario, you do often end up with considerations like that. So for cycle, uh, I don't like using step. I keep on wanting to go back and, and call this step. Um, there we go. We'll call it clock. Uh, enough uh, circuitry has a pin called clock. That feels better than cycle. Um, and it's not going to be a step because we are going to advance our cycles. catch that edge case. We should never hit that edge case, but it's good to catch something like that. The Mass, thank you very much for 14 months of Twitch Prime. Yep, Prof, Prof Ness is totally correct. Um, this is where undefined opcodes or unofficial opcodes or illegal opcodes, I've 
heard them referred to by like a million different names. Basically, opcode bits are doing something, setting up that Rube Goldberg machine that, that I mentioned. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not part of the official instruction set that that uh, is laid out, but they still make the CPU do something. And in cases like uh, the 6502, the Commodore 64 hacking scene, um, there's, uh, they, they've found some interesting uses for a lot of the, uh, the unofficial opcodes that, that weren't part of the original 6502 manual. Fraudulent opcodes, that's right. You've got, you've got uh, unauthorized opcode usage. But it is, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing that can happen because it's easy to think, you know, well, this is just, it's, it's going to crash. Uh, it's not a, it's not a real opcode. There's, there's no way that, that it should do anything. So the program should crash. But as it happens, up until you hit something that is like properly illegal, or maybe, maybe you're, you've got some data that looks like a break opcode, um, you know, that you hit something along those lines, you're, you divide by zero for uh, architectures that support integer division. But other than that, you know, the CPU is just going to keep on, going to keep on, you know, running with it as best as it can. Friend of Sears ran into something like that with uh, copy protection. Yep. Um, leaning on unofficial opcodes specifically to detect uh, incomplete or inaccurate emulators is definitely a thing. Okay, so if we are ready to execute our next instruction, our opcode will equal, let's go ahead and give ourselves bus read. Just gonna we're gonna take um, straight from PC. We're just gonna give ourselves a nice little convenience method there. So we're gonna have to do some magic here. And then I think uh, let's let's lean on after this. I think PC. Go ahead and set program counter to the result of it at um, plus one, and we will set that to modulo 65535 or 65536. Uh, do these opcodes exist to also verify that the chip is authentic? In fact, no. So. 
I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that uh, that I should play a game like NAND game or MHRD or, or one of those. I've played through MHRD before, so maybe not that one. I think I think one of these days I'm I'm gonna tackle NAND game on stream for one of the tech streams that I do. So that's a that's another very fun. Um, from what I've seen, it looks like it's uh, pretty good at explaining like how individual components are built up, and I think that you're supposed to go up through designing a CPU in the NAND game. Um, you do an MHRD, which is very fun. And if you are the sort of person who has a, a completely broken sense of what the word fun means, like I do, uh, I would unhesitatingly recommend taking a look at MHRD. But yeah, you can use unofficial opcodes to, to suss out whether or not you're in an emulator. The danger there is that additional revisions of a given CPU are not guaranteed to have the same behavior with, with unofficial opcodes. You know, something like the 6502, you look at the developer's manual, you know exactly which opcodes are guaranteed to work a very specific way. Anything else, you know, there's stuff, um, there's stuff going on behind the scenes that they very well might change, um, you know, just based on the way that the CPU is being constructed. And as long as the stuff that is set in stone that you have been promised works a very particular way, continues to work that way, in theory, you're fine with that. Uh, the game is MHRD, unless I'm misremembering it. Uh, it's on Steam, which I will link in chat. Yes, it is MHRD. Okay, I was worried for a moment. There we go. Yeah, and then I also mentioned NAND game, which is... Uh, another game that I've been made aware of. I've played through the first two levels where you take NAND and you use it to make AND. And I think uh, I've gone up through OR and it seemed real fun. And then I uh, thought I shouldn't I shouldn't do this myself. I should do this on stream sometime. sometime. Highly extracted, uh, abstracted example. Imagine some spec says to give an opcode returns a list of three numbers. First number is one, third number is three. Anybody can implement that opcode, um, but they may not all return the same second number because the spec doesn't say about that second number. Yep, that's definitely true. In this case, you think that when the software was written, SSC4 opcodes didn't exist at all, but the undefined opcode uh, the program used later was defined as an AMD unaligned SSC4 operation. That's... Yeah, that, that's a danger. That's a thing that you can run into. Yeah, so MHRD is... Um, it's very good at demonstrating and teaching concepts, uh, but it is fundamentally, like, at the very end of the day, it's, it's a game. So, you know, much like um, games like... Uh, anything that Zachronics puts out. It's great at teaching you to think about the domain in question. It's not as good for teaching you um, specific knowledge that is going to be directly applicable. Um, it's going to give you all the tools to think about the real world, though, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Zachronics is great. Um, before Flash completely bites the dust, um, which is coming soon, as I understand it, uh, if you do still have the ability to play Flash, uh, look up Constructor Engineer of the People, or Engineer Constructor of the People. What is it called? But it is the first Zachtronics game Constructor, engineer of the people. A constructor is written in pretend um, Cyrillic. 
That was my introduction to Zaktronics games, and it's what made me fall in love with Zaktronics games. Yo, Andy, how's it going? Zaktronics makes you feel simultaneously like a brain genius and a total moron. Yep, that's that's what Zaktronics does. Oh, interesting. I have not heard of Zack like. I will have to take a take a look at it uh, after I finish streaming. Yeah, Cyrillic is. I mean, phonetically, it's very easy to read. Um, once you learn how to read Cyrillic phonetically, all of the faux Cyrillic that you see get thrown around um, will both uh, throw you for a loop every time, and then. If you're me, at least, uh, piss you off to no end. All right, so what are we working on here? So we're going to do some sort of magic to look up our opcode. Um, And here, let's let's actually start. Let's start using some language features that don't get used super commonly. But because I was talking about wanting to um, wanting to ultimately turn this into more of a DSL so that we could take it and apply it, um, you know, to other CPUs, um, I'm going to start. I'm going to I'm going to start us down the path of making a a DSL. So, to that end, Should be instance variable set. Yep, cool. So we are going to set an instance variable called opcodes. And for this CPU, we can go ahead and just say we're only going to have hundred op or the uh, hex 100 op codes so 256 op codes that we're designing right now but in the future I would like to be able to make it relatively easy to disassemble So maybe this is a good time for us to take a step back and think about the data that we're going to associate with an opcode. Drex, how's it going? I am doing pretty okay. Um, been uh, spending a lot of time just chatting with friends and family and um, making sure people are Staying safe, staying healthy, uh, which is a tall ask. <laughs> it's it's a real tall ask in the year of our Lord 2020. So we're going to have an opcode. There's no reason for us to do more than just make it a struct. So what are we what are we gonna have? Uh, we're gonna want a, a mnemonic. We're gonna want to know a number of cycles that it's gonna take. What do you think? If this is going to be variable, 
we're going to need to know how many bytes of memory it's going to consume. So um, right now we're reading one byte for our opcode, but we're going to need to know how much additional memory we're going to be pulling off. We'll just call that a number of arguments. There we go. Byte arguments. Oh God, no, Andy, I, I, any time that I open a new terminal, exit vim, cd to a new terminal, I, I immediately ls because it's a compulsion. Had a rough couple of days, think that you're on the other side of things now? I'm glad to hear that. That's, that's definitely very good to hear. Yo, Summit Gretz, I hope that you're doing well. Oh yeah, if, if I CD into a, a directory full of stuff, like any time that I CD into the directory that is just all of my local recordings, um, the following things happen in order. I do an LS, and then I say, I'm an idiot. I, it's nothing but timestamp file names. Why would I do this? And then I get distracted. And then I do another LS. So uh, in this case, uh, because I think that what we're gonna be doing here is more along the lines of just giving information about the op code. Um, you're not familiar with this language. Okay, so I, only half-jokingly tend to refer to Ruby as my favorite Lisp. And the more you think of Ruby as a Lisp with a weird non, um, a weird low, uh, low parenthesis count syntax, uh, the, the happier you're going to be with it. If you enjoy Lisps and other similar languages, you're gonna really enjoy writing Ruby. What FPGA am I using? So this is this is all um, like we are we are in air quotes here designing a CPU just as an excuse to start thinking through some domain specific languages that we can design that are going to let us um, write emulators for proper CPUs. For you know, the, I think the first one that I'm probably going to do just because it's also an 8-bit CPU with a it, it looks very similar to what we're, we're building right now. Um, the first thing that I build is probably going to be a 6502. Yeah, 6502 is a good chip. The last time that I wrote an emulator was an MSP430, um, which I only needed a degree of accuracy. It didn't have to be accurate down to the silicon. It didn't even need to be accurate, uh, cycle accurate. So I just was able to build a behavioral emulator and, and do what I needed to do. But so we probably also We'll do a we'll do a function as well here. I think that is going to be good enough for us, at least for now. So that function is is going to represent the actual behavior of the opcode.
So, Okay. So we were mnemonic cycles, byte args, function. So we'll say There we go. That looks nice. Wild Mouse, how's it going? Am I planning on writing an LLVM backend? Uh, not today. Maybe in the future. Corn Dan, how's it going? You appreciate the magic here, Common? I'm glad, because right now there's, there's nothing doing that. But yeah, folks are interested in um, in compiler backends. That might be something that I uh, tackle for future tech streams. Steam page for MHRD says it doesn't look like any game you've played before. You own every Zachtronics game and many similar games. Um, I'd say the game that I've played that it is the most similar to is... I'm trying to remember the name of the game where you're writing a pseudo-assembly for a computer architecture that is largely cell-based, so you're, you're moving, you're pushing data between cells um, orthogonally. TIS-100, thank you, yes. That is exactly what I was thinking of. But yeah, that's that's going to be probably the closest game on Steam to what MHRD is like. Yeah, TIS 100 was a ton of fun. I really enjoyed it. All right, so for now, that's going to be good enough. Like, the opcode struct is really just, it's just a, a DTO here. I'm going to keep that up so that I can do that. And then... Or a reason to make this illegal, we could just make this the actual non. There we go. So we've got our knob um, in the right spot and also in a million wrong spots, which no big deal. Please don't yell at me. It 
baby answer. That's right. I enjoy CPUs, so I run CPUs on my CPUs. Panda, welcome in. Printed out the manual and played it uh, during a six hour train ride. Nice. Yeah, TIS 100 is definitely more puzzle than coding challenge. MHRD is the inverse of that. MHRD definitely ends up being more coding challenge than puzzle game. But TIS 100 was pretty fun just because you can golf it. Just like every Zaptronics game, you you end up wanting to golf every problem. Alright, so when we define an instruction, we need to define a mnemonic. We're going to want to define uh, what the actual opcode is. Cycles. How many byte arguments it needs. And we will have a function. So right now, that's we're just going to leave that as a no op, and let's go ahead and call a def inst uh, for increment a. decided our opcode was going to be at 82. Everything in this CPU is going to be one cycle because it's magic. Yeah, if you if you get like really bogged down and trying to over optimize everything and that's not the sort of gameplay that is fun for you. Um, pretty much any Zactronics game is going to be bad, but TIS 100 I think really, really pushed uh, the player to uh, to try and golf everything. Yeah, Shinjin IO was very similar in that way. All right, so Inc. A is not going to need any byte arguments. So a bit of Ruby for people who don't know Ruby. This sigil right here, this ampersand function, uh, or just the ampersand, this, this can be whatever we want to call it. But this ampersand means I can pass in a, uh, a function as part of my arguments, which is quite nice when we're defining something through uh, a DSL that we've defined. So here we can start defining the actual behavior of ink A. You should get back into code golf. It made you a better coder when you did it more often. Um, hmm. I'm not sure that, that code golf necessarily makes one a better coder. Um, I think that the purpose of programming is fundamentally communication and often golf works to the opposite of that. It works out a different part of the brain, which can be useful when you, when you tap into it while you're writing programs, but uh, golfed code is almost never communicative code. All right, so now I'm realizing that I forgot an important thing. Um, we need flags. Comp 
CompuCat, how's it going? Oh yeah, I'm not saying it's not super fun and I'm not saying that people shouldn't do it. One of my favorite books, like without uh, any any hesitation, I will say is uh, Hacker's Paradise. Hacker's Delight, geez. Hacker's Paradise, ugh. I, I am clearly not all here. Hacker's Delight, uh, one of the best books that I've ever read. One of my favorites, hands down, period. That's true. How will you know if you're carrying your whole team in a competitive video game if you lack a carry flag? So let's think about what flags we're going to need. There we go. Got eight to work from, so... Zero is going to matter. Um, carry going to matter. Tempted to just look up the flags in like a... Um, in fact, I am going to do that. I'm going to look up the flags in a 6502 CPU and just copy them wholesale because... No reason not to. Yeah, overflow, negative. Well, negative is already... Um, Carry zero, interrupt disable. No, oh, I, I even almost put carry and zero in the correct places. Actually, let's let's go ahead and I'm just gonna gonna copy the layout. No reason not to. Negative overflow. No CPU effect. I believe that is break. Doesn't actually list which of those two are break, so I'm just going to put break there. And then uh, decimal. I'm not gonna do BCD on this <laughs> on this one. Um, interrupt disable. Zero carry. Overflow, going to be useful for arithmetic, negative, also useful for arithmetic. I 
hey, sorry about that, Kate. It's not my fault that your name happens to, to have a lexical collision with uh, an important uh, CPU flag. Special flag for if the ASCII characters Tina were found in the last double word of program memory. Yeah. Uh, although on this architecture, I think that we would, we would just call it a quad word because our word size is one byte. All right. So now we have, in fact, hey, break so there we go if break flag is So clock is going to stop doing anything if our break flag is ever non-zero. And later on, we can change this to a, um, a more declarative style of, of uh, building out this functionality. But for now, that works nicely enough. zero to one if a is zero and I'm not sure if any other you know what for this CPU that's the only thing we're gonna do So now we need to actually work through the magic of defining the instruction. So this is what our defense call looks like. And in fact, no, that should be good because we already said how many cycles it's going to take. We don't need to do anything with that beyond that. Instance method define or define instance method? Go define. In fact, it's just define. Okay, cool. What if A overflows? That's a good point. In theory, if A overflows, then uh, we have already set A. The zero flag should only um, should only be set when it overflows. But no reason not to. Oh yeah, there's there's no reason that we couldn't be doing this as a 4-bit CPU. Um, 
I kind of had an eye towards the 6502 in the future, which uh, is why I have made a lot of the decisions that I have kind of off the... And really, it's just, we're going by the seat of our pants because sometimes it's a fun way to cut. Build four CPU, uh, simple one-bit CPUs and chain them. Wire them in parallel to reduce CPU voltage. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that CPUs work like resistors. That, that sounds correct to me. I have no reason to believe that that's not the case. Yeah, the 6502 is a relatively simple um, CPU, so. Okay, there we go. Sorry, that was... I, I couldn't stop looking at Vim yelling at me. Yeah, 6502 is really well documented. It's pretty straightforward. It's extremely well understood thanks to um, the fact that people have been hacking on them forever. Okay. So we are going to be executing in the... in the context of the CPU, uh, of the instance of the CPU. So we have access to pretty much everything. All right, which means that what do we actually need to, we might not need any arguments. Let's double check. So we want to call the function itself. What else will we need to do? We'll need to set our cycles remaining. built hardware acceleration for software emulation would that be a cpu a cpu pu um yes and it's a thing that yeah okay my lord root uh just just mentioned uh there were companies that were selling basically fpgas on pcie cards for that purpose oh yeah if, if you can name a um an obsolete uh, computer architecture, it's almost certain that uh, that architecture is critical somewhere in the world. All right, so we set our cycles remaining. We're going to return self, um, and that's that's a stylistic choice. I, I prefer to be able to, to chain calls when I can, and this gives us that capability. Is there anything else that we need to do? Yes. So we know how many bytes we need. So we'll go fetched equals So at the time that this gets called, this is real ugly. I don't like this. Just that feels bad to do. Um, all 
This also is ugly, but... We're gonna mutate this. Um, just gonna push some stuff onto an array. No big deal. PC adder is not needed. is going to get the byte arguments uh, that are needed, which means uh, we will always have bytes. Well, we're always going to have something. In the case of something like INA, uh, increment A, it's going to be an empty array, which is totally fine. All right, so we've handled our mnemonic. We've handled cycles, byte args calling the function. Last thing to do is to redefine There we go. All right. Main doesn't have instance methods. Interesting. It's not a class. It's okay. Yep. So now, what I really want to see happen is for this to allow me to load, which uh, all that that means is that we are... Nope. All right. Name error. Oh, yes. That makes sense. Fifty-nine. 
to find method. Cool. Polymon, it is Ruby Day. Good time to catch up with chat. Oh wow, Egrets, you have an Ultra Spark 3. Nice. Um, several, gosh, two decades ago. That that has a real bad mouth feel. I don't, I don't like that one. Um, two decades ago, I had a um, a Spark Station 20, which I really really loved. So, great. We were I in A for NK. Hey. All right, so we're defining methods. This is great. Um, that means that our DSL is kind of working. Pretty soon we might be able to, to write um, like our first Fisher-Price My First Program. We can go ahead and do INX, which I believe we said was going to be 81. Yep. Go. We've got our first two opcodes here. Um, let's go ahead and make NOP as well, which I think that we said we're just gonna, yeah, NOP is just everything high. Although I think it's probably more accurate to say that it's everything low. So let's give it hex one. Because now we can just say, mm. this is easy enough to fix. So one of the really neat things about the design of Ruby is that when we look at the declaration of a class in something like C++, um, that is purely declarative. In Ruby, uh, and this is going to make my comparison of it to something like Lisp make a lot more sense. Uh, the declaration of a class, uh, any code that you encounter is code, which itself can be run. So something like this outside of the method just gets run at the time that we are defining the CPU class, which is really quite nice. Now here we can say nop dot I think it was just fn, yeah, uh, fn equals and should be instance method not, no reason to force it to symbolify that when I can do it for it. And now,
we are in fact the real unbound method as opposed to this fake thunk that we were passing it previously, which means that I don't need to declare that, that thunk on the fly. We can just give it nil, which saves us the tiniest amount of memory. Escrum, how's it going? Welcome in. You're increasingly getting interested in assembly level stuff, especially 8-bit era. So the entire idea of building out a toy CPU is fascinating. Nice. Yeah. Um, this is just another one of those areas where the more you know, the more you, you learn about building the breadth of your knowledge just gives you more more ways of thinking, more tools that you can lean back on whenever you're tackling other problems. So yeah, I, I really enjoy just anything that I can do to to keep on building that, that um, breadth of knowledge. Polly Mono, you recently became a more or less full-time closure programmer, which has been quite fun. Nice. Um, the second language that I ever learned was Scheme, and I have a lot of extremely fond feelings towards Lisps. Um, I've played with Clojure a little bit, not a ton. Um, it is a bit more syntaxy than something like a Scheme, which I admit I did not personally love. Of course, I say that writing Ruby, which I claim is my favorite Lisp, so uh, you would be well... Uh, within reason to uh, to call me a hypocrite there. So what I'm saying is I'm not just a two-bit streamer. Oh gosh, um, Escrunt. If anything, that's giving me too much credit. All right, so. One thing that we do need to do is we need to be able to load. Yeah, Ruby has a ton of syntax. Like I said, I, I will proactively call out my um, my hypocrisy there. really like closures data structures uh is there any particular data structure that you're referring to because most um most of the time when you when you run into a functional language you expect to see some um some immutability at play. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what what you're what you're leaning on there, but um, if you look at Haskell, Erlang, you know the, the other big functional languages at play right now, uh, for the most part, your your data is going to be um, immutable, unreassignable. Um, of course, not being allowed to reassign variables doesn't necessarily, it neither means that your data is fundamentally immutable, uh, nor does it mean that, um, like, you can you can have reassignment without uh, without giving up immutability. Uh, you can see that in play in um, in Elixir, which is just a, a Ruby esque front end for Erlang. Uh, I don't want to be able to load a program. So program is going to be just a, a list of bytes.
So we're going to give it each with index. We're going to say plus dot write 8000 plus the index. Once again, we'll just have it return itself. Um, in the future, we might start uh, thinking about ways that we can um, keep a very similar program structure while supporting things like uh, rewinding, execution, um, save states, things like that. so we're loading in correctly. That's a real nice step. Um, so we've defined some opcodes. We have loaded in a program. What's next? Well, I guess I guess we need to define what magic is now. So look up opcode. It's now going to pretty much just be self.class. OK, I'm, I'm going to write this the way that, um, that my knee-jerk reaction was. Um, And then I'm going to show you how I'm going to make this more efficient. So we're going to do that. It's going to exit immediately, which is fine. This just lets us verify that everything works. Everything is working, but the important thing here is that uh, these are all references to unbound, um, unbound methods. What we want to do instead is add initialization time. Instead of binding to each of these unbound methods every single time that we're executing an instruction, we're going to bind to them. And let me think, how much are we doing here? I think that we're handling all of the reading within, yeah, within the defined method. So for the most part, Okay. 
So now, So what we're going to do is we are going to, for each of these opcodes, duplicate the opcode. And we are going to going to bind the instance itself to that unbound method. Uh, basically, I can explain what that means. So, for example, we have one, which is uh, an integer. Not, not super exciting there. Um, an important thing to know is that uh, when we do something like one plus two, uh, what is happening internally uh, from Ruby's standpoint is we're actually sending a message of plus and then the argument to, to the one object. So we can take a look at an unbound method. So un it, our unbound method, we actually can't can't call it because it's it, it needs to know what the context that it will be uh, executing in is. So if we bind it to the object one, well now we have a, just a method and it's no different than having the method pulled directly from the object one. So then we're able to call it with two and, and all, is, all is good. So what I want to do is instead of binding every single time that we walk through a new cycle, uh, I want to add initialization of a given CPU. I, I want to just bind to every single one of the, um, of the functions. We're going to create a new array of, of structs. And now we can just pull the opcodes. And then the methods themselves are not taking any arguments, so we're able to just call. I'm sure this is going to blow up spectacularly. But let's let's see. Let's see what it does. Yep, we're we're going to need to <laughs> We're going to need to um, fix some of that, uh, but we do have our two defined instructions, so that's nice. You heard a new array of escrunts. Escrunt, I don't think that, that the world can handle even one of you. All right. Cool. All right. Well, we're 
dying it. CPU 98. Let's take a look. So the good news is that we're calling into the correct... Alright, so... This is within the context of... Yeah, this is, this is running within the context of... Um... of the class, not the instance. All right, that's fixable. Q23, how's it going? You, you stepped on the knot sled? Well, right now um, our op codes are essentially nothing but an op sled. Uh, what kind of CPU is this? This is a completely fictitious CPU that we've just kind of uh, con concocted out of thin air specifically because the goal here is to uh, begin defining a um, uh, where we're defining more than anything else a domain specific language that we can then take and use to Greenleaf, thank you very much for 31 months thank you for the the series of hex 90 bits it's my favorite series of um, or hex 90 bytes. It's my favorite series of bytes to see in, in IA32 code. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar, uh, hex 90 is not in, um, in IA32. But not IA64, I think. I think that the not instruction changed, I forget. I don't do enough with, with uh, x86-64 for me to remember. Definitely not in IA64. Itanium changed a ton of stuff. All right. So. This is easy enough to fix, actually. So the big problem here is that we, um, we're trying to access instance variables uh, in a context where they don't exist. However, what we can do is we can delay that. Let's go ahead and uh, for for a and x don't need to do anything else right yet. set x fetch plus one. In fact, we don't even have to have the uh, guard there because it is
but computationally it'll be cheaper if we keep the guard here. There we go. So now we've just deferred those lookups to runtime. Uh, and that should be better. We should now blow up at MA, unless I am completely out of it, not impossible. Nope. Nope, we are still executing in... New plan. There is a um, there's a really great There's a really great uh, image that floats around the internet uh, explaining the, the big difference between functional programming and uh, more imperative styles, especially a, a class-based imperative style programming, um, where there are a ton of patterns that class-based programming tends to have at its disposal uh, for solving different types of problems, whereas uh, on the right side, the left column is all class-based stuff, on the right side of that um, that table, uh, it functions, 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 more functions, etc. Oh, NOP and x x86-64 is in fact still uh, 90. <laughs> Grinleth, I, I also do enjoy seeing uh, hex 41 repeated over and over again. Um, my favorite thing is how uh, Suricata uh, every time that you send a series of, um, of A's over the wire, uh, helpfully informs me that, uh, well, clearly somebody has hacked you. It's, there's an emergency. This is shell code for realsies, I promise. So we do need to handle this one as well. All right, so this is a, a fairly common um, refactoring that you tend to see in functional languages uh, where we have just encapsulated the function that we care about um, and we're going to be returning a, um, a lambda from, from our def inst call. The nice thing about that is that really we only have to handle that right here. We do have a function. That is now going to be function prime. We're just going to say function equals function prime dot call. And I believe No, we are we are still not where we want to be. Alright, so let's undo that work. Not a big deal.
Angami, welcome. Thank you for the raid. Welcome in, everyone. I'm Tina. I mostly do speedruns, although you wouldn't know that with the way that my channel has been recently. All right, so now is really any time is a good time to think, but now is especially a good time to think. Um, My intuition, which is clearly wrong, is that this should be executing within within the context of within the context of an instance. Let's try. Let's try switching this up. So, this is setting cycles we're not handling memory that needs to happen uh, memory fetches so we're gonna have to do that the the memory fetch now needs to happen within our clock function it's not a problem it's not something that um, it's not something that is uh, insurmountable by any stretch If that happens, we can just do memory fetches from within instructions, though. So as long as this works, actually, this will be fine. Uh, we no longer need this thunk. Or we no longer need that, that argument if we're handling memory fetches from within instructions. Uh, it might work. It's worth playing with. Yo, Evan Grill. Yes, this is Ruby. I know, I'm really bummed that I'm not... Uh, I was supposed to be stateside uh, July for SGDQ. That was the original plan. Um, grind your mind. Welcome in. Uh, so we are cooking up just out of thin air uh, a CPU spec. Uh, we're not worrying about silicon. We're not worrying about exactly the, the way that it would work internally. So there's a lot of constraints that we don't have in terms of the way that opcodes behave. We're using this CPU spec that we're cooking up from thin air specifically so that we can kind of work backwards from that and figure out what a good domain specific language for defining emulators might be. And then sometime in the future, we're gonna take that DSL and we're going to use it to build out an emulator for like a 6502, something along those lines. I've been threatening all my viewers with more tech streams, and I'm gonna I'm gonna finally make good on that threat because I keep on getting told that people want me to do more than being very bad at video games very fast. Yeah, Evan. Um, my my tickets for one got canceled. My airline tickets got canceled, um, which made it very easy to make the decision. Um, But yeah, I 
I hope that the U.S. Um, I, I want to see things get I want to see things get better as far as uh, the current public health crisis goes. Um, it's been tough. It's been really stressful to watch because of the number of people that I care about who are you know, stateside. Um, I, all my family <laughs> uh, is stateside, so it's been um, it's been real rough. Yeah, grin. I mean, my plan was to uh, was to fly to the states, go to SGDQ, go to summer camp, and then come home. Um, the only way that uh, the only thing that actually um, has held true uh, with regard to my plans is that after the end of Hacker Summer Camp this week, I will uh, be in Finland, but everything preceding that has happened just a little bit differently from the original plan. All right. This is probably going to crash again. Or not. Not the one that I wanted to call back. Oh, okay. Oh, no, it just, it super died. But this is great. We, we actually have, uh, in theory, the... Something is, is now not working. We are returning negative one. Well, now I, I feel no... reason not to do that, for one. And hey, we, we have set x equals 1 with our inc x call. So things are actually starting to look like they're working the way that we want. So that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, we did have a bunch of cleanup here that we are now going to have to move elsewhere. Not a huge problem. So let's see. Memory is going to be read from within the opcode um, code. That's not going to be a big deal. Uh, the ability to build a, a disassembler uh, is going to mean that I'm going to keep these byte args. Because that, that will be nice in the future. So we are no longer fetching data, not a big deal. We're calling the function, which does happen. Cycles remaining is the only thing that we have to, to set. We can actually set that up here. from within our call. So actually a fetch and x fetch and their corresponding sets no longer needed. And once again from clock, we're going to return self. Now things should look pretty nice. Oh. 
we should be able to chain clocks here. How, how long was it? I think that it was six. And there we go. We've got a equals three, x equals three. So our increment opcodes are working correctly. That's pretty nice. Let's go ahead and define break. There's no case where calling calling break set is going to happen and us pass zero to it. So we're just going to do that. All the other flags will will be able to to pass a one or a zero to it, but there's literally no case where. Um, Where we're ever going to to pass zero to break set because that's just nonsensical. So break, set that to null. One cycle, why not? No memory. Break set. Now. Finish it off with a break, which I, the memory is zero initialized anyway, so that's fine. So we are not broken yet. And then one more and our flag value should change. No. Interesting. Nothing's changing. So we still think we're a knob. Let's figure out what's going on here. So for uh, anybody who's not familiar with the P method uh, that you have in Ruby, it's real nice. Um, it's just uh, shorthand for puts x whatever dot inspect. Um, so uh, to give you an idea of the difference, um, if I did a puts one, that's going to work actually here. I did puts an array of one and two, that's going to give us one and two on separate lines. If we did P one and two, the inspection of it gives us just a little bit more insight into what the actual data structure is doing, which is quite nice. Your partner is explaining some of the stuff that I'm doing. Nice. And of course, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm mostly going at this like super slow. Um, I want to I want to be able to handle any questions if they arise in chat. You built this kind of project in your operating systems class. Right on. Yeah, it's it's a super fun project. All right, so let's start. Well, now that's we didn't we didn't uh, read in anything. So break You ever make just a really uh, silly error? Yeah, me too. Right. 
So now, if we call CPU clock, F should change. We should see 16, which is the break flag. And now, uh, we shouldn't see any more... Uh, yeah. We are no longer getting that output um, before it was telling us here's the, the opcode that's being uh, executed. The break bit has been set in our flags, so perfect. We are no longer executing code once break is set. So there's a lot here uh, in terms of like where we can go from here. Um, we could certainly build out a full instruction set, you know, enough to to be um, to be Turing complete. At this point, we don't really need much more to be Turing complete beyond uh, being able to write to some region of memory would be nice, although it's not strictly speaking, required. Um, hard to be useful otherwise. Um, but the ability to, to conditionally branch is really all that we need at this point. Yeah, in FG. Um, yeah, it's, it is it is definitely pretty common in uh, CSEE um, curricula to to end up um, building out a, a mock processor or something along those lines. Would this theoretically be able to have I.O. pins that you could hook up to something like a Raspberry Pi uh, to be able to put in line into an actual circuit? Would we need to be able to put together a little computer with physical RAM, clock hardware, etc. and just be able to straight up run your own quote-unquote computer? Um, I mean... Yeah, there's nothing, strictly speaking, that's stopping you from doing that. Uh, Yindi, you see a bug in the INA and INX instructions. Okay. Hit me with it. Look, I've been writing bugs for well over 20 years at this point. I'm very good at it. Flags don't get reset if their condition is not met. That's true. Yeah, good point. catch. You just key smash until code comes out. Yeah, I like APL too.
Yeah, Artric, uh, I, I wasn't going to... to um, I was doing my best to figure out exactly how I was going to respond to the question uh, without sounding um, really, really snarky. It is very difficult to respond to somebody asking what the music is, given my current stream layout. DBMS class was essentially create SQLite. Holy cow, that's that's a lot. Yo, Vi, how's it going? So if this is the kind of content that you all enjoy, um, you should absolutely 1 million percent be following Vi Gray Tech. Vi is fucking rad, and... I'm not sure that I've ever seen them not hacking on an NES. So, give Vi a follow. Um, to answer the implied question there, Vi, so right now the, the important thing that we're really hoping to come away from this with is a reasonable DSL to, uh, to be able to define a... A, a given architecture um, and have an easier time uh, building out uh, emulators. So as such, um, we're, we're getting relatively close to something that feels like we could take it and run with it. Um, probably the first CPU that I'm going to be, um, that I'm going to be tackling is the 6502. So I guess what I'm saying is, nope, not going to add multiplication and division to the CPU. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Vigray Tech is just, they're fucking awesome one of my favorite streams to have on while I am also hacking on shit. It's just a comfy, fun stream with one of easily the smartest people that I know. All right, so I think that probably the next thing that we need to do, so right now we're just, we're throwing 64K of RAM at our bus, and we're saying, hey, bus, you've got you've got this RAM, and any write is going to be within that range. Otherwise, you're just going to ignore it. Any read is going to be within that range. Otherwise, just fault to zero. And that's, that's probably the next thing for us to, to tackle. Although... I think that the first thing, well, hmm. There's a couple of things that I want to do. One of them is I would like to be able to visualize the, um, the execution a little bit better than we've got right now. Right now it kind of sucks. Uh, Shmup Dog Joe, that is correct. Uh, 6502 does not have multiply or division. Have fun implementing those yourself. Yeah, division sucks. Division super sucks. So 
so from here, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna write a dump function first so that we can visualize. we can visualize what we're working with. And then after that, we are going to change it so that we have the ability to attach different devices um, that live at uh, different regions of memory. So when we say, you know, when we put a a write at hex 100 on the bus. Maybe that gets handled differently from if we were to write at uh, hex 8950 or something along those lines. Probasaur, how's it going? Welcome in. Yeah, so we've got a toy CPU, which at this point is able to increment a accumulator register and an X register. Um, the main goal of, of this coding session is largely to uh, build up a DSL that we can use to um, moving forward to, to start building out emulators, you know, for something like a 6502. Um, the real difficult stuff and the real fun stuff um, that that's going to come later, certainly. Binary Nova, thanks for hanging out. I hope you had fun. That's right, Escrunt. Uh, we are making incremental improvements. Uh, currently, there is there is nothing uh, that is going to detract from our registers. I'm overflowing with joy at this prospect. Okay, so for now, we'll do RAM That should be real nice. Okay. You know, IRB just really does not seem to like reverse R search. So we're gonna do reverse R search by hand. That'll be fun.
cool. That is starting to look real nice. Jeff, how's it going? Yeah, so, so far we have designed essentially a DSL to allow us to interact with a CPU that we've concocted out of thin air, essentially. So now, So not quite, not, not really a CPU in Verilog. Uh, in this case, uh, the DSL that we're designing is specifically for building out emulators, not for designing the CPU itself down at the silicon level. So the DSL that we've come up with so far uh, largely is, is about uh, defining our instructions um, and building out uh, the opcodes as we need them. So the goal is to take something like this and ultimately move it into maybe making a, a pretty primitive uh, 6502 emulator, something along those lines. It's probably going to be the first CPU I, I uh, tackle. I think bus doesn't need anything. Correct. So we'll make a new CPU, attach it to the bus, and So for now, I'm just gonna just gonna bail after reading the file. Not a big deal. Really? Oh, right. You ever just decide not to run your program? Control D not giving me EOF, which is weird.
There we go. Not willing to mess with it any further. Let's just open a file and read that. Oh, actually, we're going to want to read a line. We're going to want to um, want to accept input anyway. Let's put 64. So we're loading the program at um, x8000. of 82s and 81s. And not was... What did we decide? FF. go. Looks good to me. Good time to catch up. The big problem you're running into is you're reading joystick input. You're doing it too slowly to be completed in a single V blank. just realized what the wallpaper that you have in this VM is. Pretty sure it's one of the defaults that comes with KDE. I'm just very lazy, so I haven't changed it. Fair.
Hey, it's a good time to uh, do zero set and overflow. Yeah, overflow set. Zero is one. And then overflow is the seventh bit. Line these. I need to, I'm gonna look up the um, the terminal control code for clearing screen. You would think that I would have that memorized, given that I maintain a library specifically for doing shit like this, but... Okay, so this is nice. Um, would be even better if I was visualizing flags as well, because uh, obviously I have no idea that anything is actually happening. Start, just show me that. Okay, so we are advancing the program counter as expected. Yeah, Jonas, I, I looked it up off of a uh, quick Google, which is not the same thing as pulling it out of the library that I maintain. Uh, so I could easily have been wrong. All right, cool. <laughs> no worries. Like we're we're all wrong at times. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure why they why they wanted to modify the J with a two, but I don't care enough to change it because it, it works. Like if I super duper cared, I just pull in uh, console glitter, which is the library that I maintain. Okay, so let's. AX flags.
actually, we've already got this. How many more do we have? We have three, five more. Nothing. Yes. Okay. That looks correct. Which means we no longer need to assign that. I see stuff moving. You've been unable to watch due to critical issues coming up, but checking in, how's progress? Progress is good. I mean, I can't spell the word negative, but other than my, my inability to spell, things are good. I just, I did. Okay, and this is starting to look nice. And there we go, break is set. So super crude, not, not beautiful by any stretch, but workable. Um, certainly workable enough for something of the level of sophistication that we've got right now. this. How do we want to handle How do we want to handle this? Um
I think. especially due to the fact that we want to be able to rewind in the future. I don't love the idea of allocating like 64K of RAM for, for example, a system that might have 2K of actual working memory. Um, and besides that, like right now we have a single addressable rate, like space, period. Um, which is suboptimal uh, in that it's often nice if computers can have any amount of interaction with the outside world at all. So I think that we are going to do initialize. We're just going to have... We're going to have a list of attached stuff. We're going to have to change write. We're going to have to change read. Not a huge problem. The inspection is definitely going to have to change. Um, but one thing at a time. So I think that what we're going to do is we're going to make make a device type. It's, it's going to be another struct. But it's going to be, it's going to be something that we can, we can use as a blueprint to define different types of behaviors later on, I think. Class. This is going to be, well, I mean, it is a class, but all right. So our device, we're going to give it a name. That name is only going to be useful for, uh, for actually printing out like for, for our inspect and two string methods, but it's nice to have. Um, Give it an addressable range start and range end. Let's see. And of course, it's going to need. might not necessarily need anything beyond that.
actually I don't think that the, the struct itself needs to know about its own range. That's something that the bus is meant to keep uh, keep track of. Because right now we've got, uh, to, to make this a little bit more real, uh, we've got working RAM. Like, we all, we all know how that behaves. Um, but our I.O. is going to be on the bus as well, potentially. Um, might be memory mapped, but it might not. There's no guarantee there. So if, uh, if a system has, uh, you know, some manner of input, um, you know, that just lives on the bus, say, at hex 9000, just to throw a number out there. We need to be able to define the behavior. And maybe I'm making this too complicated. Maybe maybe we should start with RAM and then and then iterate on it. Glitch Garden, thank you so much for 30 months. That's incredibly kind of you. Exor Tux, how's it going? Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, there is no specific target in mind. Um, a lot of the goal, and I will pull us back over to the DSL that uh, we've ended up concocting so far, uh, but a lot of the goal is to end up with a DSL that we can use uh, to start working towards maybe, um, you know, targeting uh, multiple uh, CPU. So maybe we use this to to build out a 6502, maybe a 68K, something along those lines. Um, so far, uh, this is 100% just a CPU that uh, we've kind of pulled out of thin air specifically to drive the development of the DSL itself. But no, that's, that's a totally reasonable question. Um, so definitely no no reason to be sorry for it. Okay. Actually, now, now that I'm thinking about it this way. So attached, we actually want to uh, to be a three tuple. So having this as a three tuple makes it makes it simple. Um, not the most computationally efficient, but relatively simple to search through. What's the D? I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure what you I'm not sure where you saw a capital D. Um which makes it really tough for me to answer that question, Glitch Curtain. No, no worries, no worries, XOR. Um when I do text streams like the goal of, of me ever doing text streams on Twitch is to make it so that I can be didactic for as many people as possible. Um, if I wanted to hunker down and get shit done and not deal with, you know, people asking questions, well, my, why bother streaming that? Like, that's that's put on tunes and hack time. That's, that's not stream on Twitch and hang out with people time. That's my view anyway. Um, so yeah, definitely, at least in this space, don't don't worry about asking uh, asking questions, even if they've been asked a million times. Oh, oh, you were asking what what the the D stands for in DSL? Yeah, domain specific language. Um, in this case, uh, the domain would be generating 
um, emulators. Melos, I hope that you're doing well. It's good to see you. All right. So now, Attach a device okay got it got it got it now I'm starting to understand how this needs to work any given device is going to need to provide a write and a read um, method and that's what the device struct is actually going to do just going to have a name. Smoke Dog Joe, did you miss the part where we are emulating dot 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 a clock uh, or something so that the number of cycles matters for instructions, even though they are all magic one cycle? Apologies if this is a massive derail. No worries. Um, for a fake CPU that doesn't exist that we've dreamed up, literally it doesn't matter. But if we wanted to uh, take this and move into like a 6502, uh, if we were looking to just be accurate to the behavior of the CPU, then tracking the number of cycles that a given instruction is going to take, you're right, it doesn't matter. Um, if all that we're hoping to do is, is take some code, run it, see what the output is, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, being cycle accurate is going to matter. But if we want to be cycle accurate as opposed to just behavior accurate, um, cycle accurate, still not accurate down to the silicon. There's a ton that goes on and that's why some instructions, most instructions, are going to take way more than a single cycle to complete. If we were trying to be accurate down to the silicon, we would be modeling what's going on inside the CPU. And there are excellent, like with the 6502, there are some excellent uh, emulators out there which are able to do that. Man, I, I feel real dirty reading your handle. It's, it's a very funny handle. Um, so I'm going to preface this with, this is not, this is not a call for people to throw money at the stream. Um, accepting donation, uh, is this like a general purpose emulator, not one for a specific CPU or console? You are sort of correct. Um, what we are working on right now is a framework from which we can build emulators for other architectures.
no worries. I think that it's a really funny, I think it's a really funny handle. Um, I, um, I am, I'm not saying that it's a bad handle. It's just one of those things where, as a streamer, reading it out verbatim um, can definitely, like, there's a look there. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's, um, that's a consideration. Yeah, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I would have the courage to, to stream from your particular handle. Um. I think that it's, I think it's a really funny handle. But yeah, I, I would have a tough time, uh, hitting go live if, if I had that class of handle. Okay. So we're actually making the devices by calling attach on the bus, and that's fine. Um, So we need... We're gonna want a, a default implementation for read and write. And then... method actually it would be yeah any chance that I'm ever going to want to allocate something other than just a block of memory for a given device. I don't think so. I think that any time that that's going to happen...
anytime that's going to happen, it's going to happen um, external. So this is probably fine. Suggestion, right returns a true or false, depending on if the operation was valid or not. Uh, that's, so for one, uh, read and write here are default implementations, and they're just, they're returning a zero. Um, it's worth pointing out that in most systems, writing data onto a bus actually isn't going to return anything at all. Um, I don't like returning nil, otherwise I would do this, um, but that zero should hopefully never be used, and the expectation is that we would, after uh, creating a new device, we're going to be over, uh, over, um, overriding the read and write implementations anyway. You just got an ad to stay productive from anywhere you need. Orchestration by Cal. Yeah, I would think copy on write as well when I hit that that acronym. Oh, it was it was um, an advert for a company with a very bad font, um, making making it so that their advert was ineffective. Well, gosh, that sucks for them. I, I wish that they had, um, I wish that they had thought of anything else. Yeah, you'd have multiple devices if you had non-contiguous blocks. That's definitely true. Um, it was less about... It was less about... Um, non-contiguous blocks when I was thinking through this and more about things like what's it going to look like when we have video RAM or something like that. That's going to that's gonna get interesting, but not a consideration that I have to make at this stage. Okay. So now... Every time that I hear this song, I, I want to stop whatever I'm doing and play Tower of Heaven. Anybody who hasn't played Tower of Heaven, um, you should before Flash stops existing. Right, so we aren't guaranteed to be a bite anymore. It's It's just as likely that we end up getting a word or whatever. <sighs> so I just realized a, a bug here. Detect actually returns, I believe, the actual object. Yeah.
So Detect terminates early, which I really like. Rocket Launcher, how's it going? Detect terminating early is nice, but... that it's possible to have overlapping ranges on on a bus on any machine that I'm aware of. So my instinct is to disallow this. But for the moment, because I'm lazy and it's 3 a.m., This is what we're going with for now. Playing Paper Mario on the Switch. Nice. now inspect and two string are going to be the same but that can easily change Barney, how's it going? So I'm in Europe. Um, I moved to Finland a decent while back, back in um, August last year, um, which accidentally landed me in one of the safer areas to be in currently. Um, so far, my family, for the most part, has been... Um, has been managing to stay healthy. Um, but I've got tons and tons of friends and family in the US and there's um, plenty of hardship to go around for sure. Exactly, I decided that, that um, 
my summer car looked like a really neat game, uh, but I wasn't convinced that it was perfectly accurate. Um, I can report back now that it is. Okay, so... I put my head through walls in Finland. No, I've tried. Um, that trick still doesn't work. Um, I suspect that if I were to use enough force that it would eventually, it, it would take. Um, the problem, of course, with that is that uh, at some point the force required to go through the wall and the force required uh, to cause my head to stop functioning uh, probably converge. Yeah, as, as Shmup Dog Joe uh, puts it, if you try hard enough, um, you can put your, your head through walls pretty much anywhere you want. Much better. Yeah, I feel way better about that. Pretty sure that's going to work still. Just not, in fact. Okay, it does. Perfect. Much happier. This would be a flat map to dump. That should, in theory, work. <laughs> the only thing that you learned while playing My Summer Car is how to pronounce Perakele. Nice. Honestly, I think that that's probably one of the most important 
uh, lessons that you can learn in that game. So, you're doing well. Are we ready to try? No, we're not. We are super duper not ready to try. Um, because... RAM are we gonna have? It's more than enough RAM for anyone. Nobody needs that much RAM. Okay, so now we need to call set read and set no, we need to call Alec. Then we need to call set read and set write. Read just needs an offset. What language is this? Uh, this is Ruby. an offset is it it's still they're gonna it's gonna get past an address which means that it needs to be we'll fix it we'll fix it in the bus um, it'll get an offset going to be a single byte for sure. And this is almost certainly going to blow, uh, blow up. That's not a big deal. Let's see. A seven and initialize. And define method. Array accessor for nil class. That's good. Yeah, yeah. It it does help if um, if you just uh, assign things instead of counting on your um, your interpreter to know what you mean. So now we're, we're passing in an offset uh, instead of the explicit address, which is good for any device that's actually going to track that. Glacier Wolf, how's it going? Interesting. 
Did I mean to find single? Actually, yes, I did. Thank you. Better. A 17. Hooray! What? Hooray! Well, that's unexpected. There we go. Better. here. What? All right, you're a struct here. stinks. I'm not thrilled about that. The question is whether or not I want to blow up when when I ride out of bounds. And I think that blowing up such that the entire emulator crashes is probably a little bit outside of the scope of what I want to have happen. Being a perm programming noob, what language am I using? Uh, you don't you don't need to worry about um, <laughs> about uh, beginner style questions. Uh, so this is being written in Ruby um, and you could easily be forgiven for not recognizing it because this is not uh, what most Ruby tends to look like, for sure. Uh, we're leaning on uh, some metaprogramming. We're uh, largely aiming to build essentially a domain-specific language that we can use in the future for uh, fleshing out emulators of actual CPUs. Uh, the opcode list that we have for this particular um, CPU is minimal, to say the least. Uh, you would have a tough time writing a meaningful program with nothing but break, increment, uh, A and X, and knob. Like realistically, you're not you're not going to write anything particularly meaningful with this instruction set. But it's enough for us to 
to kind of flesh out the really gritty details of how we want this working. That's gross. I don't love that. All right, here's what we're doing. Select. Take one. Map. Same deal here. I don't like doing this because uh, we lose the nice uh, early bailout that we had with the detect. List of attached devices on the bus is hopefully never going to, um, never gonna reach the size uh, where that really matters, but like it, it feels bad. It's a bad feeling to do that. Why did I choose Ruby for this? Um, in terms of programming languages that I have professional experience in that I've been actively programming in, um, I've been doing Ruby since uh, 2001, 2002. Um, and it's been a language that I use pretty actively for that entire time span. Um, compared to something like Haskell, I, I write a fair amount of, but I've only been writing it for a little while. Um, five, six years now. Likewise, Erlang, a little bit longer than Haskell, but not that much longer. Um, I could have written it in C or Scheme, but Ruby seemed like a good language to choose for A, writing, you know, a domain-specific language. Um, Scheme is another obvious choice for something like that. Ruby is pretty approachable. It's pretty nice. Um for uh, being able to write in a style that is going to be relatively easy to understand. And since if I'm doing uh, text streams, the goal of them is entirely to be didactic. Um, I care a lot more about that than like, you know, churning through a ton of code and, and you know, this is this is not a this is not a stream to show off in. This is a stream to give people a chance to, to hang out, um, to ask questions. Um, the expectation is that most of the given stream that I'm doing, if I'm doing a tech stream, isn't going to be actively developing stuff. It's going to be chatting with people and asking questions. Not a big fan of in statements. Uh, that's fair. Uh, based on that, I'm going to guess that you're coming from... Um, you're coming from like a um, like a Python, maybe a Haskell um, background, but most most languages, you know, whether it's your whether it's your you know C you know having your your termination be a curly brace or a, a scheme. You know, having your termination just being your your um, closing parenthesis. There's um there's not too many languages out there that don't have some some way of terminating a block. Yeah, Binder News, I I actually, so to be clear, um, one of the things that I like least about Ruby is actually the, the end. Um, but that's that's a opinion that I've come to hold within the last about five years, uh, probably less than that, largely because, like, I finally have, have decided, actually, I enjoy writing Haskell enough, and it it makes enough sense 
that I um that I'm okay with it. You're fine with closing braces, maybe it's a bit hypocritical, but having end all over the, over the place makes it look uh, empty. Or it makes it look, not empty, busy. Um, that's, that's a fair assertion. Um, I think that like any programming language, you know, something like having end as your end of the block statement um, for multi-line blocks, you'll notice that uh, the Ruby, uh, the kind of normal style is for single line uh, blocks, we'll use curly braces. That is equivalent to do and end. But yeah, I, I think that that you get to you get to enjoy the code that you enjoy, and you get to find the code that um, that you don't like so much, you know, less desirable. Um, I think that, like with any language, you, you kind of get used to it. Like I write, I write Erlang. I actually really like Erlang. Um, and Erlang is is fairly famous for having um, not the prettiest syntax around. Yeah, it's, it's either braces or do and end um, in cases where there is a do. Uh, something like a def requires an end. You can't do def, you know, blah, 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 and then a curly brace to end it. That's that's not going to be considered valid by the um, by the compiler. Should be good. Maybe. New error. New error is always nice. Plus device 28 and dump. Ah. In this case, that's my fault. Great. All right. Well, we are able to attach RAM. We're able to uh, dump that RAM now. So we are we are now attaching just a device to the bus, which is real nice. Um, this is good. This is one step closer to what we were hoping to, to have done by the end of this stream. Yeah, Glacier Wolf, I've got, and I think most people who've been programming for, you know, a, a fairly large amount of time uh, have uh, just a, a set of languages that, you know, depending on what we're doing, we're going to, we're going to lean on. If I want to write like a super distributed network service, I'm almost always going to reach for Erlang. Uh, Erlang is purpose-built for that task. 
if I'm looking to, you know, sit down and bang something out, you know, over the course of how long have I been live? Four hours, probably. You know, almost four hours. Ruby's a pretty good option. Um, if I'm more concerned about the correctness and uh, enforcing the correctness of data that I'm being given, probably going to pick up, you know, a Haskell. And I, I'm going to going to probably lean on that. In a lot of cases, I end up, especially for something that I expect to be long-lived, I quite like leaning on Haskell. Um, just at the compiler level, you get a lot of assurances that are quite useful. You're trying to learn Rust. Rust is another really, really great language. Um, it's one where it doesn't really fit any of my use cases that aren't already filled pretty, pretty nicely by, um, by Haskell. Um, there's a couple of spots where today I would probably lean on C still um, if I had to do anything like and memory, like resident memory matters. Rust is very quickly getting to a point, though, where I'm going to be able to have the option of leaning on Rust instead of C, and I really quite like that. Yeah, Python's another really great tool that a ton of people lean on. Um, back in the early 2000s, basically everybody did Perl. Um, everybody who was, you know, doing reverse engineering and and needed something to quickly write, like payload generators and stuff like that. Um, Perl was just kind of de rigueur back then. And everybody who was doing Perl back then, uh, almost everybody, certainly, um, today is, is probably doing either Python or Ruby. Yeah, if it's quick and hacky or it manipulates a lot of text, Python, yeah. If it's quick and hacky and manipulates a lot of text, for me, it's going to be Ruby for all the same reasons that you would choose Python. All right, uh, CPU 71. So let's take a look at CPU 71. Interesting. What do you think opcodes is? What? How did that break? Oh, wait, no. Opcodes. Opcode is an array. Because read PC is now getting back. Okay. So that is probably going to be a problem in. This is going to be ugly and terrible. I know why.
doing a take one, then we're doing a map, which means that we are... We are safe to call first on those. We won't be throwing anything away there. There we go. So, if you'll recall, previously we had a bunch from the zero page here. Uh, I didn't attach any memory to the zero page. So, we aren't bombing out on not being able to debug something that doesn't exist. The RAM is attaching correctly. We are reading the program in. We're executing it as expected. We just hit break and we are no longer executing. So for a start, this is pretty okay. Um, And I think that this might be a pretty good stopping point, given that it's just about 4 a.m. Um, this has been fun. Uh, I will be pulling this code off of this machine, and I'll be throwing it on my GitHub for anybody who wants to peruse it, play around with it. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm going to be playing around with the idea of, um, in addition to just putting this entire stream in its, you know, raw format up on YouTube. Um, also, maybe cutting it down, uh, making a new voiceover, giving a, um, giving a bit more um, context around everything that's going on, cutting out all of the, uh, <laughs> the, the long stretches where I was just hanging out talking to chat, which is really great in this format but this is probably a four hour YouTube video, which once it's cut down, could be like 45 minutes, something like that. Doc Saint, welcome in. Yeah, this is, it's been a fun one. It's one that I've thought might be fun to do on stream for a while. And, um, and I've been, I've been looking for a longer sort of project that can go more than a single, um, a single uh, stream session. So it seemed like a good one to, to pick up. But I think that's going to do it for now. Uh, we are at the point where we have devices attaching as expected. Uh, we're able to define our behavior uh, on the fly. The next steps here are taking a, a look at what we've got and then filling in the gaps so that if I wanted to do, like I said, the, the first goal is going to be a 6502. Um, figuring out what's still not there just yet. Filling that in and then, and then hopefully, you know, next time we can end up with a 6502. You know, not perfect, not necessarily even great, but functional would be real cool. Something that could... Um, that could run, you know, just a a little bit of code, something like a, you know, a trivial multiply some numbers or, you know, things like that. Just enough to uh, to get us there would be real cool. But yeah, I think that's going to be it for me for tonight. Um, I really hope that you've all enjoyed it. I hope it's been fun to watch. Uh, I've definitely had a ton of fun hanging out, chatting, you know, hacking on stuff. 